Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of A Cup of Coffee with Tissot Experts. Today I'm with Fatima Drifi, she is in Morocco. Hi Fatima. Hi Diego. How's it going? Great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. It is a beautiful day here in Colombia. So Fatima is a participant in our Developing an Online Teaching Program and she is a wonderful teacher trainer. Uh, she works at CR. Mef Sous Massa. I think that's in French. I don't know if I said it right, Fatima. Yeah, I um, did. <laughs> yeah at the Department of English. Um, she has been training novice teachers of English for 12 years. And before joining this training center, um, she taught into different public high schools for five years. Uh, she also earned mm -hmm. a qualifying EFL teacher certificate from ENS Rabat in 2003. She has a master's degree in literature and culture. She participated in a distinguished Fulbright Words in teaching program at the University of Maryland in the U.S. And so she is a PhD scholar studying the integration of intercultural competence in EFL. So uh, that's a very impressive profile, Fatima. I'm so um, glad to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our question today is, uh, how can we deliver online learning when resources or connectivity are limited? And this is such an important question because, you know, like last year when we had to um, start teaching online, like a lot of our students didn't have access to computers or phones or, you know, uh, maybe there is only one computer at home and everybody has to share that computer. Maybe the power goes out. You know, there are so many uh, yeah. issues with technology and access. And this is true for every country, really, because we think like, oh, that's... Mm -hmm like a third world country problem, but that is not true. A lot of students in first world countries also have issues uh, with connectivity and access to technology. So we wanted to, I wanted to invite Fatima and, and our guest expert to talk about this and share some ideas. So uh, Fatima, who is our guest expert today? Okay, let me introduce Heidi Faust, um, who's an ESP specialist and a TESOL consultant. And uh, she previously served as the Director of Learning and Engagement and TESOL International Association. She has a PhD, or she is a PhD candidate in language, literacy, and culture at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and holds a Master's of Education in Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages and Certificates in Educational Leadership and Online Learning. Heidi uh, specializes in developing online learning opportunities for uh, low bandwidth, low read contexts. As the former director of TESOL professional training programs at UMBC, which provided scaffolded online courses for English teachers in over 100 countries, including the TESOL methodology course for online professional English network for the U.S. Office of English Programs. She was also awarded and led an English uh, language capacity building grant to support English language enhancement and communicative language teaching practices in public schools in the Dominican Republic. Heidi has worked uh, with teachers globally as an English language specialist for the State Department in Turkmenistan and led the development of English curriculum for 8,000 volunteers of the wow. Asian indoor martial arts games. That's amazing. Well, let's uh, welcome Heidi first. Hi, Heidi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's good to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Well, first question. I've always said your name Heidi. Is that right or is it Heidi? And now it's, I'm hesitating. It's, it is right. <laughs> uh, most Spanish Heidi. speakers pronounce my name Heidi. Um, it's German oh. origin word. So in German, it would be Heidi. It would be Heidi. Yeah. But, but how um, do you say your name? Heidi. Heidi. Hi. Uh, okay, so then I need to change it. <laughs> no, I'm used to I, Haiti. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's fine. I know I know what you mean. <laughs> okay, I see. I see. This is important. You know, names are important. They mm -hmm. matter. Sure. So, um, Haiti then, right? Mm -hmm. How can we deliver online learning when there are no resources or limited connectivity? That's a great question, Diego. And I think a lot of teachers and professional development specialists are facing that concern. Um the first thing and the most important thing is to consider the context of where you're working and the, and the students or the learners that you're working with. And so context can vary a lot. We wanna consider what kind of access do participants have to bandwidth and internet? Do they have to pay for it? Do they have to pay for data or go to an internet cafe to access online learning? Are they doing it on their phones? Do they have a computer? Some of those things are important to consider. I know in doing professional development with teachers internationally, 
we we know a lot about different contexts. In some cases, teachers are working six day work weeks and they don't have a lot of time for online learning. And so we had to consider how much we could do in a certain amount of time. We might consider what people have access to in terms of um, is Facebook blocked or is there access to YouTube or do you need to use Microsoft technology but maybe don't have access to that software? So the first piece is always a context analysis to see what your participants have access to and what they might need support with. Um, after that, we would consider providing an orientation to the digital, flat, the digital platform tools and tasks. So making sure that they know how to log in, how to upload an attachment, how to um, participate in a discussion board, all those kinds of tasks might be something that are new, especially in a context where people may not have a lot of access to digital opportunities and digital technologies. They may not also have the skills to do some of those things. For an example, in some of the contexts I've worked, teachers didn't use email. Um, and so they weren't really sure how to set that up or how to log in and to have a password that they saved. Um, those were some things that we had to practice with and, and reinforce in our orientation. Um, in other cases, um, people I've worked with have done that on different platforms, but they were working on a new platform. So there were some things that they just had to find. So it's helpful to create tutorials, to walk people through the systems that you're using, and to make sure that they know how to do it before you ask them to learn content because learning technology is already a layer of, of learning. And then you, you add content on top of it, sometimes in a second language or a third or fourth language, if you know there's different levels of language proficiency uh -huh. there. So it can be very cognitively demanding and we wanna consider those things when we're orienting our participants or our learners. Um, the next thing that I would consider would be providing multiple options to access content and to submit work. And so, providing the opportunity to watch a video, but if you don't have the bandwidth to see something that large, you could download a transcript and read it. So multiple ways to access that information. Or a participant who maybe asked to write a reflection or submit an infographic, they could do that digitally online and submit it. But if they don't have good access to internet or they don't have a, a computer where they can type a lot, Maybe they're going to handwrite it and take a picture of it and send it via their phone or upload it that way. So being flexible in terms of how they submit work, how they access content, and also how they communicate. So again, working with teachers who weren't using internet, or, or sorry, weren't using email, email was our primary mode of communication internally, but they weren't responding because they just didn't check it every day. It wasn't something that they were used mm -hmm. to but many of them were on their phones, on Telegram all the time. And that became a much more useful way to communicate or having a WhatsApp group or a WeChat group, something like that. So having multiple flexible ways to connect um, with the content, submit work and communicate. The next thing I would suggest would be consolidating materials for offline and asynchronous work. And in that case, we have to consider, again, if teachers or your students, um, they have to pay for internet or they have to go to an internet cafe or, you know, it's just in high demand or there isn't very good bandwidth, consider the opportunity to work offline. So you want a variety of high tech, low tech solutions. So the idea that um, maybe I'm gonna create a download packet of all the materials for a learning module in a PDF form. So a learner could go online and just download that packet and work offline as many hours or minutes as they needed, and then come back after they were done with the work rather than having to be on the whole time. Um, also considering opportunities for um, asynchronous work, the same thing with the video. If a video is, is taking too much bandwidth or data to watch, having the opportunity to look at that transcript. If I have a PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to provide a PDF with the notes but I might also make a nice video presentation so that people can see my face and hear the language of what I'm saying too, which provides a different kind of uh, multimodal access to that information. So especially if their um, participants are 
not um, if they're learning English or they're um, using English as an additional language that provides pronunciation practice and the ability to listen while they read. Um, but you can also download it and do it offline. So building in that constant flexibility in your materials and your platform and lots of scaffolding for participants. And then the final point that I would bring up is considering multiple devices. So you might have students who are doing most of their work on a telephone, a cell phone of some sort. Um, maybe they have a tablet or maybe they have a printer, maybe they have a computer. Um, what we learned is that sometimes apps and software and programs or even a learning management system like Canvas or Blackboard or something like that, it looks different on a phone than it does on a computer. And so part of developing that means you should test it in both of those scenarios so that you can help um, problem solve when a participant or a student says to you, I can't find this link or I don't know where this button is that you showed me in the tutorial. <laughs> Because in the phone, it might be located in a different place than it is on the computer, or it might not even be there. Sometimes they don't have the same um, abilities, depending if you're working on a computer or on a phone. And so being able to be very nimble and flexible about what devices and technology and software participants or students are using is really important as well, considering that People may not have access to Microsoft Office, even though in the US we tend to use that a lot. But for our international work, we work in PDF. Um, we use rich text files. We, we try to be more flexible and, and provide opportunities to engage in lots of different ways. So those would be my big um, recommendations and to say be really flexible including with deadlines is the other piece is if someone mm -hmm. is working long hours or mm -hmm. having a really hard time getting to the internet. Um, I one time had a student who walked two miles to get a generator to get online for class. And so we had to be really flexible when things were late mm -hmm. and, and that became less important. And what became more important was the learning and really focusing on the relationship and the, that welcoming environment because it can be really stressful to try to learn online when you don't have access to the resources that you need. So uh -huh. those would be the big ideas on my end, I think. Wow, that was wonderful. And <laughs> I know you have lots of experience doing this, you know, multiple mm -hmm. countries and every context is different. You brought up great points, things that I had never thought about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I love it. You know, like, like you said, do not assume anything. Like I would assume like email is like standard, like everybody does email, but maybe mm -hmm. they don't, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, And the other thing I just was thinking as I was listening to you is that all of these recommendations are wonderful. Uh, and they are because you have limited resources or connectivity. But if you really think about it, this is just good teaching. You know, like I am interested in universal design for learning and accessibility. And so like things like giving people a script or a transcript, that is great, you know, because then maybe some people will understand better if they read, some other people will prefer the video. So, or like you said, you know, like give people different ways where they can deliver their work or assignment. That is also a principle of universal design for learning. And so like really? it is, the things you suggested are because of technology, but I think we should do it regardless, you know, just because it's good teaching and good practices. A hundred percent agree. So, yeah, 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 that is great. And, you know, for me, uh, the technology, you know, like the, it's not, the real challenge is how to be creative and resourceful. Mm -hmm. And so like, like you don't need high tech, you know, like I've seen teachers that maybe, um, you know, like they, the students have like a textbook at home. So they just use that. And then you can send them like an audio recording explaining the activity. And so the student takes pictures and then that's mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so like, really it's about meeting the needs of your students or your context. And like, that's why you started there, you know, like first, like who are your students? What do they have access to? Mm -hmm. And what can I do? So it's really a matter of uh, being mm -hmm. a good problem solver. I think. Absolutely. And being responsive. And I think I was able to share a lot of these um, tips with you because we bumped up against them. <laughs> a lot <laughs> of it was trial and error. Like, how do you, you know, how do you deliver a class in a space where the people don't have internet or the electricity goes out or 
you know, I, I think part of it is being responsive. When, when a student says to you, I'm sorry, but I can't access this, you have to have a backup mm-hmm. plan. <laughs> and yeah, so right. it's better to design it in the beginning with the backup plan in mind than to try to have to figure it out later. Wow, that is so true. So I'm here in Colombia, we, you know, like you have to buy a phone and you have to buy a data plan, but sometimes uh, things like WhatsApp or Facebook or Instagram are free or unlimited. So like they will not use your data plan. And so that's something we could use. Like if we know our students have access to that, we might as well use social media or or WhatsApp or Telegram. And so Fatima, uh, she has some ideas because she's been using uh, uh instagram right to teach and so mm-hmm. fatima what you know what are your strategies or what do you recommend we do on instagram okay so uh i would like to thank heidi for mentioning some very good points here uh, i actually um looked into um, some other people or other educators have been doing with instagram and then i started having my own uh, ideas about how to use it according to uh, my situation so um, I think that Instagram can be used for language production. Um, for example, I can use storytelling to teach listening and writing. Uh, first, first of all, I can, for example, post two different photos on Instagram, plus a video telling a story. And then uh, I can ask my students to guess what picture is being in it. Um, and then students can ask questions about the picture. So, so this is the, the, the listening part of it is where they have to listen to my story and the writing part of it is where they have to um, uh, write those questions in the comments area. Um, the second um, activity is picture description uh, to teach writing. So um, students, I can ask students to post a picture with the description underneath in English then um, I will um, teach them how to tag me. So whenever they post a picture, they can tag me as a teacher so, so I can see it. Then um, I can comment on the photo in writing. And then students can comment or ask questions about the photo. So it's, it's very much um, uh, related to uh, writing. Um, I could also use Instagram stories uh, so, can, so they, can, uh, they can view my story. Um, this uh, activity would be uh, the word of the day or the word of the week to practice vocabulary. So I can, for example, post a word, um, a collocation or an idiomatic expression, um, uh, then add a definition or explanation to it. And then um, students uh, read the word and then they will have to swipe to read um, or view the definition and explanation. And then for practice, and I, I can ask them to use the new word in context. So this is how they, uh, they can uh, actually um, learn how to use the new word uh, uh, in context. All right. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, these are great ideas that you could use them and adapt them as you wish. Like recently I had a teacher who is using TikTok, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because that's what students are using. And I don't use TikTok, I don't have an account, but they, she tells yeah. me that it's really great to make videos and it's very fun to edit them because it adds a lot of elements. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, um, if that's what students are using and if that's what they have access to, you might as well, you exactly. know, use that for teaching yeah. purposes. So I love that, Fatima. Thank yeah. you so much. And I just exactly. love the, the multimodal aspect of Instagram and how you're using writing and listening mm-hmm. and, and also the visuals. It's also really authentic. Mm-hmm because students, mm-hmm. especially middle school, high school students, or even university, they like to be interacting on social media. So yeah, I felt exactly. like those were really great ideas. Mm-hmm. So yeah, thank you, Fatima. So when I've had situations where my students don't have access to the internet or whatever, I've used mostly WhatsApp. I know that another app that is very popular is Telegram. And so um, I just, I was just looking, I just read about some of the similarities and differences. And so WhatsApp, uh, it saves the pictures and the videos and everything locally on your phone. So that is a problem for people that have phones with no space, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And so Telegram, yeah. uh, it's saved in the cloud. So, you know, it doesn't use a lot of space mm-hmm. in, on your phone. So that could be a great option. And the other thing is that on WhatsApp, like if you send a video, um, it has to be maximum 16 megabytes. On Telegram, it can be up to two gigabytes. But I think it's better to keep things uh, small, you know, because if the problem is technology or connectivity, then you don't want to send two gigabytes, you know, to someone Mm -hmm. on their phone. And so uh, when I make a video, 
then what I do is that I use this software, it's open source, it's called Handbrake, and it helps me compress and make the video smaller. And so if the video is, you know, like uh, 100 megabytes, then all of a sudden it's like 10 megabytes. And so it makes it easier to be shared, you know, uh, through phones. And so that's just a little recommendation I wanted to share. Uh, and now that we are getting to the end of this video, I, um, you know, I don't know if you, Heidi or Fatima, have any closing thoughts or remarks that you want to share with our viewers. I guess my my big my my big message would be again just that flexibility and that as you said universal mm -hmm. design to consider all of these options and be really flexible to be able to shift mm -hmm. between them based on what your students mm -hmm. can access and it's been great yeah. to come together to also brainstorm and i think that's yeah. another message is talk to other teachers because people mm -hmm. are figuring it out and you know they have these golden nuggets that you might not have thought of mm -hmm. I would have never thought of Instagram mm -hmm. for English language teaching the way that you talked about it, but it's a great idea. So Thank you. That's, that's important. Yeah, I, I believe that whatever whatever resource we use, we always have to think about it as a process of trial, error, or trial success. We yes. always mm -hmm. try try things out. We don't know from the beginning if it's going to work or not, but we have the idea, we need to exploit it, we need to see what we can get out of it. And then, um, uh, I mean, adapt it or change things. It depends on the situation. It depends on the variables that we have, the kind of students that we have. So uh, thank you so much, Heidi and Fatima, for your ideas. It was so wonderful. I'm sure that people that are watching this also have lots of ideas. So we want to invite you to uh, leave a comment here in the video. Let us know what you're doing, what, how you are approaching this problem. And um, yeah, so thank you so much again. And I'll see you next time. Bye, Heidi. Bye, Fatima. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Thanks Diego. so much. Bye, Heidi. Nice to be together.